Okay, then once again, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Maria Zainu and Naomi Kempo of the Courage Foundation. Colvin, Colvin, some, oh, Naomi, Naomi Colvin of the Courage Foundation and Tactical Tech Collective, um, who give a talk on, um, well, uh, the Snowden revelations, the Snowden archive, and the visualiz visualization of the Snowden revelations. Yeah, welcome. Um, so, yep, yeah, hello. Um, it's really nice to be here. Full house, it's very exciting. Um, so, Maria and I are going to talk to you about the Snowden revelations and um, the Snowden documents. We realized when we were putting this talk together that actually we were putting it together on the third anniversary of the first Snowden report coming out, which was not deliberate, but it's sort of a nice synchronicity. Now, it's been three years, and I know there's a temptation to think, well, you know, it's old news now, right? Like, you know, we sort of know, know a lot about, you know, know a lot about it. Surely we've moved on to the, to the next thing. And I think if there's one thing we'd like you to take away from this talk is that we've only really scratched the surface of the potential insights for this group, very important group of documents. And in particular, one of the things that needs to be done is looking at the meaning of the group of documents as a whole, as opposed to bit, you know, document by document or part of document by part of document. So um, I know that talking to a C-based audience, you guys I, I have an unusual amount of expertise in the Snowden documents and you probably know everything there is to know about them already. So if you'll just you know, indulge me in telling you things I'm sure you already know. Let's take a step back and think about this set of documents as a whole and what the Snowden archive is and what it isn't. And I guess the first point I'd make is that while the Snowden documents tell us an awful lot about surveillance capabilities and confirm things that many people thought and, and you know, and uh, made us aware of things that people haven't even, haven't even imagined, what it is not is a complete account of even what surveillance is now globally because, obviously, mainly NSA documents, some GCHQ documents, some from other Five Eyes countries, it gives you a view of surveillance capabilities with a particular slant and a particular geographical slant. You can imagine, for instance, if you had a similar cache of documents from China, you'd have much more cov coverage of um, Africa, whereas you know there's a lot of stuff about Latin America in the, in, in the reporting that's come out of the Snowden documents. So there's that bias. Um, the next thing to point out is that it's a very varied document collection. If you compare it to something like the State Department cables, which was another very obviously another very important set of documents, but one that has a consistent format, and so one that you can index and get an idea of what you know constitutes a complete set, you can't do that with the Snowden documents. There's training presentations in there. There's um, first-person narratives, newsletters from people who work at the agencies. There's you know. Um, there's you know, documents taken from internal, in, you know, intranet articles, there's technical documents, there's just a whole load of different stuff. There's even duplicate documents, documents that don't have dates. It's a really varied collection, and one that, if you look at it as a whole, it's impossible to say, oh, I can see we have X, what, that, that document, 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 and then there's that missing. So that's something we need to consider. Um, and then, sort of compounding that, Obviously, we don't have the complete set of even the, the documents that Snowden acquired. What we have is a very, is what is probably an unrepresentative sample because, for instance, there's many more training documents in there than is probably representative of the entire set because I guess suffice to say that the documents the NSA uses to train its own analysts are also quite handy for journalists to use to explain particular programs to their readers. Um, the other point I'd like to make about the way that the documents have been published, um, they've been published, I guess, one by one or even section of document by section of document um, to satisfy sort of, 
you know, to, for a journalist, for a journalistic rationale. So they, they were published at particular moments when they might have been politically significant or had resonance, and they've been published to illustrate particular programs at, at, or particular dynamics at particular times, and have also been published by different publications in different countries, all of which have applied different standards for, you know, the format in which they publish the documents, sometimes different redaction standards. It's basically, you know, in terms of generating a coherent set of documents, it's not been the best, and it's been done for understandable reasons, but it meant that um, working for the Courage Foundation as I do, and we run Edward Snowden's Defence Fund, and we wanted to do something to make sure that um, the documents remained accessible and useful for future researchers. There was a sort of job of work that needed to be done here. So I'm gonna move on from this sort of general introduction about the documents to talk to you about a couple of the projects that we've done to make the documents more accessible and then Maria will talk about another one. So um, the first thing we did, and this is um, the Courage Foundation's Edward Snowden website at edwardsnowden.com slash revelations. And this is a chronological list of all of the news stories which have come out about the Snowden documents, sort of annotated with the, the re related news articles and, and, and the source documents where we have them. And one of the things that we did, or I did actually for this, was that say, if we think about one of the most well-known documents to come out of the Snowden archive so far, which is, you know, the the PRISM presentation, which I'm sure you've all seen. Um, the way that was published, I think it was the Washington Post which, which published that first, or was it The Guardian? But they published four slides, and then the ne another story came out about it a bit later, which published another couple of slides. And basically, there's about 20 slides now, but they were all published by different publications at different times. So, I s so in putting this together, one of my main jobs of work was to say, collate all of the PRISM slides into one document which doesn't, you know, it doesn't sound like much maybe, but it was a job of work they needed to do because nobody else was doing it. So um, that's, that's the first thing we did, and it's useful to researchers in some way, but of course, unless you want to search things by, you know, a particular news story that came out at a particular time, it's not, you know, there's more that, you know, there's more that you can do with this, and it's not very helpful if you want to search through all of the documents at once. So the next thing that we worked on and this is a collaboration with Transparency Toolkit, which you'll find at search.edwardsnowden.com, is a full text search of all of the Snowden documents released to date, which you can then search through um, by, by a number of criteria, including country, countries mentioned in the documents, um, SIG ads mentioned in the documents. We've got, um, a f we make, did a few sort of broad category searches in there as well. Um, so that's another thing we've done to try and make the archives more, um, you know, more, more accessible for people who are looking at the time. And we know from the page views that quite a lot of people work on it. And at this, but even on top of this, there's still quite a lot that can be done. So I'll hand over to Maria for the next bit. Thanks, Naomi. <coughs> Uh, so as mentioned, I work with Tactical Tech. Uh, recently, I've also started working with UNI, Open Observatory of Network Interference. I'm already starting to be speak fast, so that's a bad sign. So I'll start speaking slower. Anyway, but today what I'm going to talk about is actually a project which is not affiliated to any of the organizations that I work with. Uh, it's called Surveillance Without Borders. And it's based on an extension of what Naomi was just talking about. And it basically uh, builds upon uh, the revelation page that she's created. Um, so I don't know. Um, when was the sorry, one sec. Okay. So before we get to surveillance without borders, um, when the Snowden revelations came out, um, I thought that this was a fascinating opportunity because that meant that three of the most, well, arguably of the most common rhetorics 
we, we would be able to debunk them, you know, based on the data that we now had in our hands. This is a unique opportunity because for all of those who have also been doing research prior to the Snow Moon revelations, you probably uh, you probably feel me when you probably feel my frustration in the sense that, for example, when we would analyze laws which allow for surveillance, or when we would do an investigative research and we would talk about surveillance, everyone would basically dismiss us as conspiracy theorists. And what we needed was basically the data. And so we got the data with the Snowden revelations. The first question was, how do you make sense of that? Uh, given that a lot of the, of the publication of the documents, as mentioned by Naomi, were news driven. So in, the, in, the, in that sense, I mean, it made a lot of sense because, for example, if something was happening in Palestine, they would leak documents specific to that. If something else politically or relevant to the news was happening, that released documents specific to that. But in the end of the day, as a researcher, if you wanted to ask, you know, very basic questions, it was kind of difficult to go through all the data and, and find and put the pieces of the puzzle together and kind of get, an, again, an overview of the big picture. Naomi really helped with this. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, my work was based on hers in the sense that uh, through their page, I had a list where I could find all the, all the documents and all the relevant articles all in one page. Um, but then the question was like, okay, if um, I want to know which companies have been implicated in surveillance, which companies have supported uh, the NSA or other agencies, how do, I how do I find all this information through all the documents? Kind of like, good luck, you know? Um, or we all know that various intelligence agencies around the world have worked with each other, they've collaborated on various things, as we know from the news articles. But again, if you want to aggregate all this information, kind of again, like, good luck, right? So what guided my project was basically these three um, very mainstream arguments. The first one being that, um, and many of us are familiar with this, I guess, or have heard it, that surveillance is an American Western issue. This was something that we heard even more so before the Snowden revelations happened. Um, and this is something that I had to deal with a lot, especially when I was working in India and where surveillance was kind of dismissed as something very elitist that only, you know, is relevant to uh, the US. But even after the certain revelations happened, and even though we would see in documents that many other countries were implicated, um, still many people would dismiss them because they would argue that, oh, these are NSA documents, therefore they're only specific to, you know, the US. So the first thing I wanted to do based on the documents was to explore basically where is surveillance being carried out? Is it indeed just an American issue or not? The second thing was, well, this is probably the most mainstream argument, that surveillance is carried out for national security purposes. And while I hope this is true, um, at the same time, again, the data would give us a great way to actually explore this question. So to answer the question of why is surveillance being carried out? And as for the third rhetoric, um, that kind of is about like, who are they targeting? So the justification about surveillance being carried out for national security purposes is with the aim of preventing and detecting crime and terrorism. So the argument here was that we're all fine, we're all safe, because the target is criminals and terrorists, right? And again, I hope that's true. But to be able to answer this, I, it kind of made sense to you know, go through the data and find the facts. And so I started off by asking some very basic questions. So who is carrying out surveillance? Who are they targeting? What type of data are they collecting? How are they carrying out surveillance? Et cetera, et cetera. These are, some of the, these are only a few of the questions uh, that I was asking. Based on these questions, um, then, uh, again, so I had uh, your revelations page from the Courage Foundation as a, as a baseline. Based on that, then um, I started basically categorizing all of the revelations. And they were categorized under six main categories. The one was um, political leaders under surveillance. The second category was corporations under surveillance. The third category being collaboration between intelligence agencies. Fourth category, collaboration between corporations and intelligence agencies. Fifth category, mass surveillance. Sixth, cat sixth category, targeted surveillance. Therefore, in the targeted category, including more targets beyond just politicians, well, just beyond politicians and corporations. And so based on those six categories, I started off by basically, you know, uh, putting all the revelations in their categories and then started collecting data based on, on all the documents. And so for each document, the data collection process was again answer, basically asking these types of questions, collecting this data in CSV files, which are in GitHub. Um, and with this basically to try to provide people a place where if they want to find quickly information which answers these types of key questions, they can easily get it. 
The types of data collection also include uh, code names for surveillance programs. They include details of how the surveillance was carried out, like what type of surveillance are we talking about, um, how, are they, how exactly do they do this, who collaborates it in terms of uh, companies, other intelligence agents, and so on. And this was, and within the data collection, I was also collecting um, country codes. So that, that could, the aim of that was basically to be able to answer the, the to answer the first question of where is this being carried out. And based on all that, and since I was collecting uh, all this data based on country codes, then it obviously made sense to create a data map and to show what surveillance looks like based on Snowden regulations. So um, this is Surveillance Without Borders. Um, I c unfortunately, I can't show it to you right now online, but if you go to uh, surveillancewithoutborders.com, you will find it. And you can play with a map. It's interactive. Um, this is a snapshot, what you can see here basically, if I recall correctly, um, this is under the category of political leaders under surveillance. And all the, green all the green countries are the countries where documents specifically reference them because political leaders in that country have been targeted. And by political le leaders, I, I mean diplomats, prime ministers, um, and other public officials. Um, and through this data visualization, what you will see is that you can choose one of the six categories, and based on that category, uh, the colors on the map will change because obviously uh, different countries are specific to each category. And then once you click on the country, then below you'll find all the specific revelations, and then under each revelation you'll find the data which has been collected, answering some of these quick questions like how, why, when, and so on. And go and, play, go and uh, check it out and you'll see the details for yourself. Um, the global thing here, um, I know visually is not very great, but uh, <laughs> essentially the reason why there's this global uh, circle there is because a lot of the documents were not specific to one country, but were specific to everyone. In the sense that, for example, uh, when documents refer to, uh, I don't know, PRISM, which, yeah, so that's not country specific, and most people in most countries around the world probably use Google services no matter where they are, so therefore that is global. And it's interesting to see that actually most of the revelations fall under global, um, and that kind of shows the global scale of it. Um, I think the, the most interesting thing from doing this project, oh, by the way, this, I would really appreciate your contributions to the project, because uh, to my understanding, the documents will continue to be leaked, and the data collection process is quite, uh, it's, it's very interesting, but it's also quite tedious, so some help would be really be appreciated. <laughs> uh, I, I promise you will learn a lot. <laughs> anyway, um, the interesting thing overall, I think, in terms of this project is that the main, uh, going back to the main three rhetorics that I mentioned in terms of surveillance being an American issue, carried out for national security purposes and target criminals and terrorists. If you go through the data in this map, well, just the map itself shows that it's clearly not an American issue, right? Second of all, and if you go into the details, you'll, that, that will you know, elaborate the rest. Uh, in regards to it being carried out for national security purposes, while I must admit there are some, you know, some documents which do cite crime and terror and so on, you will see that the majority of them, I think, or many of them at least, are actually um, for political reasons or for economic reasons. So you see, for example, um, there are many documents about how they intercept the communications of government representatives at the UN level, um, at the climate summits, and so on. In short, this was all carried out to you know, provide some kind of political advantage to the US in global affairs and negotiations. But this advantage uh, it, it, you know, is global. It's not only in comparison to one or two countries. Then in other documents, you see that they had interest in targeting specific companies. In some cases, they target these companies because these telcos were hosting the infrastructure for uh, MPs or others. Um, again, political economic reasons. In other cases, you see that they targeted Petrobras, um, the biggest oil company in Brazil. So we see that in many cases, the real underlying reasons, according to the documents at least, are largely political and economical and not really about national security per se. And, but then again, of course, it depends on how you, you know, determine national security. That is kind of a vague term and always has been, I think. Um, 
but it's, it's also particularly concerning because we also see that there's also a lot of um, reinforcement of geopolitics, uh, geopolitical dynamics of power. So when you see that the NSA, for example, um, you know, intercept the communications of Palestinians and provide the data to Israel, or did the same when it aided Turkey in its operations against Kurdish separatists, you see that a lot of this is actually, inter you know, is political in the end. And the targets are not really necessarily uh, criminals and terrorists, or at least is not restricted to that. And I know we've had a lot of discussions about this, especially in this sort of community, but now we have the data which proves that, and I think we should be using this data more actively. And this is the part where we try to call for action, so to speak, <laughs> whatever that means, but uh, what essentially, for starters, I think what makes sense is to try and understand the data. Try to understand it by, you know, first of all, supporting people like Naomi who are doing an amazing job with archives. Make sure that, you know, that they continue to exist so that other people like me and other projects are able to, you know, uh, tell stories based on them. Um, and then, based on this data, it would be great to have different people from different backgrounds taking action. Now, on the, on the top here, I say that surveillance should not only be an issue for geeks, so to speak. Uh, I don't mean that literally. But, you know, we are kind of a niche community who are working on this issue. And in fact, I think that all of us, regardless of our background, regardless of what it is that our passion is per se, should to some degree care about this and, and take some action because th this, uh, in the end of the day, this is a, a largely political issue. Um, so, for example, it would be wonderful if, like, through Surveillance Without Borders, uh, lawyers would find the data, see if the surveillance carried out in their country was lawful or not, and if not, hopefully take some legal action in their country. Um, the idea is that through Surveillance Without Borders that it will inspire action around the world. So, for example, if you are a journalist in, say, Malaysia, and it's not really clear to you how you can use the documents or what the documents mean in, ter in terms of your local context, hopefully by going to the map and finding the documents which are specific to your country, you'll, you'll be able to uh, get started in terms of action. Um, and of course, more stories need to be told. Uh, the type of data collection that I did was obviously pretty biased. I asked very specific questions because those were the ones that I was interested in. Uh, others could ask different questions and do different types of data, uh, data collection and obviously uh, create different types of data visualizations and tell different stories. The point is, in short, that we are sitting on a gold mine in terms of information. And sure, the sort of revelations at this point might feel, you know, a bit too 2013. But in, I think that the main reason why they feel so to 2013 is because they were news driven. Because sure, yes, it was, old, it was news in 2013, maybe not so hot news today. But we shouldn't forget the fact that we are actually sitting on documents which illustrate the global landscape of surveillance and how it works. And this is very valuable information that we only wished for in our wildest dreams several years ago. So I suggest that we really make an effort collectively to send information there and to take different types of action depending on our skills, our abilities, and so on. And if you're wondering what the source is, here's where you can find uh, the Snowden Archive that Naomi and Courage Foundation built as well as the Snowden Docs search to search the documents, the link for Surveillance Without Borders. Any questions? <laughs> Naomi, Colvin, and Maria Zainu, thanks a lot for your talk and also for the work that you did and keep on doing. Um, questions, remarks? Yes. Hi, I was just wondering how you'd respond to the people who say that um, it's been too little has been released, you know, that they should have just put like everything out there, which is obviously quite a radical thing, but that is a pretty valid criticism. Um, I I'm all for having more documents out there. I don't I think that strategically releasing documents that have maximum political effect is a totally valid is a totally valid strategy, and there are all the sort of boring arguments about, um, you know, uh, the possible sort of reputation, you know, blowback from releasing every, everything everything at once, which I think you know, you you can you can buy or not, but it's almost sort of a very well rehearsed set of arguments now, which everyone is familiar with. What I do think was something that was missed, and obviously I think some was missed because I then spent a lot of time trying to put it right, is that there should have been 
at the beginning an idea of, well, at, so, at some point, if we, even, if, even if we can't release everything, what is released needs to be all collected together in some form, and there needs to be a way that this is preserved for people to come back in the future you know, and look through. And that seems not to have been thought about. That was something that was, something that was missed. So um, I'm, I'm glad that, we get, that we're getting there now and putting the documents uh, and putting the archive on a more secure footing. And one of the things I probably should have said during the presentation is that the um, sort of the, the actual document set, which is used for the document search, which includes sort of the full text of all of, all of the documents, is also available on GitHub. If you go to... Um, the Snowden document search and look at sort of the info thing in, in the corner, you can find a link to that. So there's all the raw data is there now for in one place for people to mess around with and do whatever you like with, really. Sorry, I hope that answered the question. Okay. Maybe one more question from my side because I missed it in the beginning. Could you just tell us two or three more sentences about the organizations you work for, the Courage Foundation and Tactical Tech Collective. Just a short summary, because I missed that in the beginning, <laughs> introducing you. Uh, sure, okay. Um, so the Courage Foundation was set up, I guess, almost two years ago now. We're coming up to our two-year an anniversary, sort of small toddler organization. Um, we w it was set up initially to house Edward Snowden's Defense Fund and, um, and do that. Since then, we've taken on several new beneficiaries um just we just um a couple of weeks ago we announced that chelsea manning was a beneficiary of ours which is obviously you know very important to us and a, and a great honor but we also run the defense fund for barrett brown and jeremy hammond and lowry love who's facing extradition from the uk at the moment so um i invite you all to have a look at our website and the cases that we're working on um, I work with uh, t uh, Tactical Tech and with the Open Observatory of Network Interference. So Tactical Tech is a nonprofit organization based in Berlin, and we work with human rights activists around the world in terms of digital security trainings and uh, privacy awareness raising. Um, and the Open Observatory of Network Interference, otherwise known as UNI, some of you might be familiar with it, uh, is a free software project uh, which aims to detect uh, cases of online censorship through the collection of network measurements. So those are the two uh, organizations that I work with, but this project actually I did it in my free time, so it's not connected to any organization. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, if I uh, understood you correctly in the beginning, uh, you said that you're sure uh, that only a small part of like the gold mine was already found and there's still a lot uh, out there. Uh, why are you so sure about that? Because I know, uh, I'm sure that lots of intelligent people uh, had a very close look at all the, or at the gold mine in the past three years. Yeah. Okay, why are you so sure there's still news? Uh, I can, uh, it's a good question, and I can give you an answer in several parts to it. Um, the first part of it, which is sort of the premise of what we've been talking about in some ways, is that, yes, there's been some very detailed work done on, a, done on the documents, but in general, it's been, looking at the, it's been looking at individual documents or parts of documents one by one in response to particular events or looking for particular small things. There has been little work done so far on the document set as a whole, and that's partly because it hasn't really been collated in one place until some, until some work was done on it. And how, how do I do know there are more insights to be found? Um, mass surveillance is one of the great issues of our age. And if you look at, and yeah, the way that, you know, there's been obviously been some political reactions, there's been some legal reaction, there's been, you know, we know a lot more now. Um, Legal actions have brought, you know, further document releases. But, you know, uh, just out there, I heard that um, the, the Investigatory Powers Bill, the UK's new surveillance law, had passed its third reading in Parliament. There's been not really enough in the way of public awareness and public anger and public debate about this in, in, the, in the UK. I mean, th th I know that things are probably, you know, better here and you have a... Anyway, so, um, but in my opinion... This is, part, part of the explanation for this lack of political action is that we haven't really communicated the impact and significance of this well enough. And I think that 
my feeling is, my intuition is, that a lot of the source, we have the source material, we should be making better use of it. And we should be looking at the data and looking at the data as a whole, the tools available to us, the insight that is in this room and other rooms like it to um, communicate better, not just, you know, public as a whole and different sections of the public who aren't geeks and aren't already active on this issue about why this matters to them. And I think there's a lot more work we can do there.